This episode is brought to you in association with Janus Anderson Investors. It's for promotional purposes only, is not for forward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise. Past performance is not a guide to future performance, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only, and references made to individual securities should not constitute or form part of any offer or solicitation to issue, sell, subscribe, or purchase the security. There is no guarantee that past trends will continue or forecasts will be realized. Hello, and welcome to Trust Radio, the investment trust podcast hosted by Janus Anderson Investors, where we take a deep dive into the questions investors really want to know the answers to. My name is Andrew Chaguri, and today I'm joined by Job Curtis. Today we'll be talking about the trust results for the year ending June 2022, areas where Job is finding opportunities, and the outlook for dividends. We will also look at the impact of high inflation and interest rates on company margins. Job, welcome to the show. Pleased to be here. So Job, you've just recently announced your annual results for the year ending June uh, 2022, and the trust has increased its dividends for the 56th consecutive year. Now, how have you been navigating the, the last 12 months? Well, it was actually a good um, 12 months for dividends. We um, particularly we had some very big special dividends from our investments in, in the mining sector from companies like Rio Tinto and Anglo American and BHP. So um, it was a good period and I'm very pleased that we the dividend was covered and we were able to put £6 million into the revenue reserve. Obviously markets have been sort of more choppy since the start of the year with inflation and interest rates and the um, obviously the war in Ukraine and actually City's defensive characteristics have come out and um, we outperformed the index by 5.9 percentage points over the 12 months to the end of June as our kind of more defensive type of portfolio with dividend paying large companies did better than the market average. In such a difficult complex market environment where have you been finding opportunities? Overall we, we're in fairly defensive companies as I said and in terms of contributors BA Systems which is the UK's leading defence contractor and it's also um, a very big defence contractor in the US in fact their business in the US is bigger than their UK business that's been a long-standing holding and it's been in our view quite undervalued and obviously that's had a very good performance this year so that's been very pleasing and in addition our holdings in the tobacco sector which obviously have got their issues longer term but they are very resilient in recession and they've done well that's BA Tobacco and Imperial Brands and also we've benefited from takeovers the UK markets in my view being quite cheap for one we've seen a lot of takeovers across the market and portfolio we've had Bruin Dolphin which was taken over at a quite a high price and in addition Daily Mail in general was also taken private by some families so uh, those are all kind of factors which have helped us. You know, one of your biggest weighting uh, in the trust right now is financials which is quite interesting. What is the underlying driver of that allocation at the moment? In terms of the banks we are sort of underweight but we do have positions in HSBC where we're underweight but, but are quite a big position that's underweight relative to the index are waiting. We also hold Lloyd's, Box, and I've actually recently bought NatWest because the banks are, t- to some extent, beneficiaries from rising interest rates in the terms of the margin between what they lend at and they borrow and then to put the pay for deposits. Um, it, it's easier to manage in a kind of higher interest rate environment. And so I'm expecting quite good dividend growth from the banks as well. So we're kind of less underweight, the banks, than we have been. Obviously, the danger with the banks is if the economy does go into a deep recession, then you get impairments and low losses. So, you know, I'd, and you also always have the kind of regulatory factors. I always be, be slightly cautious on having too much in the banks. But I think at the moment, they're in quite a good place. I've got more really in insurance and financial services. And I think the UK has got some very good companies in this area. They also benefit from rising interest rates uh, but in addition that uh, there's some very attractive yields available in some of our life assurance companies like phoenix group or m&g which is a mixture of fund manager and life assurance i think these dividends as on my analysis are kind of well underpinned and deliver growth as well so you know i think financial services is something the uk does quite well and we've got um in the, in the portfolio several different companies I mean, obviously bruin dolphin was taken over it's a private client wealth manager and i think this is an attractive area of kind of secular growth and I've replaced that with a holding in Rathbones which is another leading private company wealth manager which looks very undervalued if compared to the takeout price of Bruin Dolphin and yet at the same time is paying a decent dividend and it's got good growth prospects in my opinion. High interest rates and elevated inflation are the key elements that have been driving the current market repricing. 
How are you thinking about interest rates and inflation risk today? Well, I think you're right. I mean, obviously, inflation is approaching it's almost 10% in the UK, just under 10%. And interest rates are now moving up quite dramatically from almost zero, as they have been. And obviously, the central banks ease monetary policy at the early stage of the pandemic appropriately. But I think, benefit of hindsight, let it go for too long. And mm. the inflation genie is slightly out of the bottle now. And now they're rushing to kind of reduce or sort of slow things down and bring inflation under control. So it is a big factor. Stock market-wise, it obviously affects companies with a lot of debt. A lot of that debt will be fixed. But Ultimately, it needs to be refinanced. So in City, we've got a quite a conservative approach. So we tend to be wary of companies with too much debt. I think they're not really the best companies to pay dividends for a start and invest enough for the future. So I'm um, particularly in cyclical sectors, which are prone to downturn in profitability. So some sectors lend themselves to debt more easily than others, like utilities, where the revenues are very d- dependable. Uh, I think the other factor in terms of interest rates, how it affects the stock market, is the valuation of some of the very expensive growth stocks, where a lot of value has been attributed to growth in down the line in the future years and if you've got a higher interest rate the technical way of valuing that that future growth is lower because you're discounting it at a higher rate so i think that's had quite a big impact on the stock market this year both here and in the us and you know worldwide and some of those highly rated stocks so much good companies have had a de-rating from very high levels i mean city we tend not to be in those type of stocks we have a more of a value approach and so we're more in the kind of more modestly stocks which we think are more modestly rated but where the growth prospects are still undervalued relative to the rating and, and paying a reasonable dividend. I mean it's interesting you've touched on high interest rates and inflation and you know, one of the effects of that is reducing company profits by reducing the revenues as the costs start to increase. Meanwhile consumers are going through a cost of living crisis and we've seen disappointing earnings starting to trickle in especially from the consumer discretionary sector. Now, previously, companies were managing to pass on these costs to consumers. Are we at a tipping point now where that's no longer possible? We're very underweight, the consumer discretionary, and I think that is the area that's being most badly hit by the margin squeeze, as you say, because consumers in this kind of environment are likely to put off high-ticket purchases, and so demand is falling at the same time costs for a lot of these companies are increasing, so they have a double whammy. But other areas of the market are much more resilient. I mean, consumer staples companies are able, these are kind of everyday purchases that people have to make. I mean, they're not unaffected. They're affected to varying degrees, but they are, in general, able to pass on costs much more easily. And other parts of the market, like our oil companies, are actually benefiting, of course, from higher oil prices. I talked earlier, the financials do benefit from higher interest rates as well. So I think it would be wrong to generalise it on the whole stock market. It certainly will hit some companies badly, especially in the consumer discretionary arena. As happens in every cycle, when consumers are downbeat, they always adjust their spending depending on the economic cycle. And one of the trends we're seeing right now is consumers are switching to private labels and discount brands. Have you been increasing your exposure to consumer staples, for example? It's quite a big area for us. We've got around 20% of the portfolio in consumer staples, and mm. including that are tobacco stocks, BA Tobacco and Imperial Brands, which are in the top 10. And then also companies like Unilever or Diageo or Tesco's as well, which is just outside the top 10 our food retailer. And they're all considered consumer staples companies for many years. This area has been a really solid building block of the portfolio. I like these companies, apart from Tesco's, they're mainly global companies, very dependable dividends. I mean, they may not grow particularly fast, but with much more consistent growth than you find in other parts of the market. So this is also, for me, a very good building block of the portfolio. In terms of whether we're going for discount retailing, we've actually got one investment in a discount retailer through 3i group which is a new holding we bought second half of 2021 and this is a kind of investment company and actually it invests in private companies but over half its net asset value is invested in something called action which is a big discounter on the continent which is growing in continental europe which is growing very rapidly and been a highly successful investment for them so we have got some exposure but that's the only real discount retailer we've got in the portfolio but it is about half of the value of the 3i share price is made up of action I think an interesting thing about your portfolio is that a lot of the companies uh, generate a lot of their revenues from overseas. And lately, they've been benefiting from a weaker pound. However, with input costs rising, a falling pound risks making those input costs more expensive. What are you hearing from your portfolio companies about currency risk at the moment? If you look at our portfolio and you drill down over 80% is in shares listed in the UK. If you drill down underneath where the actual revenues come from, about two thirds come from overseas where in terms of their sales so a lot of UK companies are quite global in their 
or international in, in their nature. But I think you have to sort of differentiate between companies that are manufacturing in, in the UK. They might be importing raw materials where the costs are going up because of the weakness in sterling, and they might be squeezed a bit. On the other hand, there are other companies which might have operations in the state, which are like a subsidiary just operating in the US as a self-contained company. And they will benefit really because in terms of the UK shell, because the profits they make is amplified by the fall in sterling. I think the fall in sterling has been much more marked against the US dollar, where I think the US dollar has been particularly strong. We have fallen a bit against the euro. I think the story is much more about US dollar strength, where strength of the economy there and the Fed will reserve their central bank has been particularly hawkish or aggressive in its interest rate increases. As discussed, you hold Shell and BP, which are companies which have benefited from higher commodity prices. The question is, will commodity prices continue to rise? And are we headed for a commodity super cycle? It's a good question. I think commodity price as a whole and the iron ore price, which has been which is key to some of our mining investments, that's actually fallen a bit recently. That's very much linked to China and, and the Chinese economy. So the commodity prices never go one way, They're quite cyclical. In terms of the oil price, which is so important for us all, and the natural gas price, I think the issue slightly is for a variety of reasons that companies have been under-investing long-term future decarbonisation, electrification, and also pressure from investors, and, and also for disappointing returns. So I think the companies have been under-investing and at one point, the oil price collapsed during the pandemic and everyone was locked in and couldn't travel. Now, of course, there's been a big rebound and demand's come back and the oil supply's not there. And then on top of that, you've got the whole Russian situation. Russia's an important producer of oil and, and gas. So I think it's a combination of circumstances. I have to say in the sh short term, and the thing about oil fields, it's, apart from the shale oil in the US, which can be switched on and off relatively easy, but most oil fields take a long time to develop. And so... The supply in the short term is fairly unresponsive, so it's quite hard to see the situation improving much in the short term. The positive is weakening economic demand that for oil is reducing a bit. So actually the oil price since the spike at the beginning of the Ukraine war has actually come off a bit and seems to have stabilised, but at, at much higher levels than we've been used to. So I think we've probably got to a sort of stable, kind of more elevated level, and uh, but obviously a bit depends on kind of how things go in Russia and in Ukraine as well. I think an interesting question that's that's come about more recently or in recent months has been that people and some sections of society have been asking, is it ethical for some of these commodity companies to, to continue paying dividends while consumers struggle to pay their gas bills? What's your take on that? Well, if you go back in uh, 2020, when the first stage of the pandemic, and I mentioned the oil price was incredibly weak, actually, uh, BP and Shell's profits came under a lot of pressure at that point, and they both cut their dividends. So BP cut its dividend by 50%. Shell will cut its dividend by two thirds. So it was major dividend cuts and pain felt by the shareholders of those companies. I think if you don't allow companies like BP and Shell to do well in the good times, then they can't invest. New oil fields are, and natural gas, incredibly expensive investments. You've got to allow them to make profits in the good times in order to invest enough for the future. And obviously we're heading towards a low carbon future but as we're discovering at the moment we'd still need oil and natural gas so there is a requirement during the so-called transition phase for us still to use oil and natural gas and i think we definitely need the companies to invest so i, I definitely wouldn't favor a windfall tax at all speaking about the performance of the uk market the FTSE has outperformed us and european indices so far this year however with headwinds coming from high inflation a windfall tax on major companies which we've just discussed and a cost of living crisis, it brings up the question, is the UK market still well placed to outperform its peers? Yes, I think it's partly to do with the composition of our index. We're not particularly heavy in technology shares, which as we discussed earlier, have been yeah. underperforming this year as they got derated. But we have got quite a big oil sector relative to other. So those sort of features is one of the factors. Another factor is kind of the weakness in sterling, as we also discussed, helps the translation effect on overseas profits. But we've still outperformed even in taking away that currency effect. I mean, having said that, the UK has underperformed quite badly since around 2016, other world markets, yeah. again, partly due to index composition. So we've caught up a bit this year. We've got a long way to go. And But I think the number of takeovers of UK companies does indicate to you the value in, in the UK stock market. Uh, we've had quite a few companies. And last year, from City Support, as I mentioned, Bruin Dolphin, taken over by Royal Bank Canada, Daily Mail and General taken private by its family and Morrison's the supermarket group taken private by the private equity group and that was just three from City's portfolio and I mean we're in loads of others and I think that just indicates the value even if you look at our UK 
companies relative to the same type of company overseas, you know, there is a discount, which I think is, you know, the dividend yield on the UK market is also fairly attractive relative to the main alternatives. So I think for investors, you're paid while you wait. And I think the takeover activity is indicating a decent amount of value in the market. Just before we finish, I'd like to touch on a few questions about dividends. UK dividends have rebounded strongly since 2020. And since then, we've seen bumper payouts from miners, oil, and, and banks. However, in 2021, 33% of UK dividends came from just five stocks. And the top 10 payers are forecast to generate 56% of 2022's total payment. What would you say to those investors who are concerned about concentration risk in the UK? I think it's one of the issues one deals with as an active fund manager. You know, we do have a, around 17% of the portfolio in overseas listed, so we can, we can go up to 20%. So we've got some very high quality overseas blue chips in the portfolio. I'm not particularly concerned about the concentration risk in the UK. Certainly the biggest dividend pairs over the last two years have been the mining companies. And I would, I'm expecting those dividends actually to decline. So, you know, I've, I'm anticipating that. But on the other hand, I'm expecting bank dividends to improve. They're still catching up from where they were before they were banned, stopped from paying dividends at the time of the beginning of the pandemic. And I'm also expecting oil company dividends have recovered a little bit from the savage cuts that they made in 2020. But I think there is further scope for oil companies' dividends to recover. And I mean, I think across the market, there will be areas of dividend cuts, like the consumer discretionary sectors where dividends are bound to be under pressure. But elsewhere, I could see other sectors being much more resilient, like consumer staples. And certainly, companies with overseas profits, you know, that they'll, they'll be benefiting from translation of effects we've been discussing. So that will be helpful for, for their dividend growth. So overall, I would anticipate, and it's only my, my personal uh, view or based on the work I do, is, is kind of low single digit percentage dividend growth for, for new commercial overall, but obviously cuts in some areas, but um, yeah. better dividends in other areas. Finally, what is your outlook for UK dividends in the coming months? And do you think income and value investments will continue to shield investors from elevated inflation and higher interest rates? Well, as I said, I think overall there'll be cuts in parts of the market, but I think the dividend growth was going to see what I'm expecting from areas like banks and mm -hmm. overseas earners up with about low single digit dividend growth would be my personal view based on the work I do. Having said all that, I think dividend paying equities are a good place to be in that obviously the stock market is inherently volatile in, in the long run the market goes up but over short periods it can definitely go down and on a daily basis it swings around so I think it's very comforting as an investor if, if you're in dividend paying stock or fund in the sense that you are getting a return inherent volatility in the stock market in my view a lot easier to live with and actually over the long run studies show this is a very long run going over decades that a lot of the return from shares actually does come from the dividend you get some capital appreciation but actually it's a very important part of the overall total return which is a mixture of capital gains and it's often not fully appreciated by outsiders that this is the case and you know i think investors have bills to pay etc so having kind of a dividend check coming into your bank account is quite helpful just you know help you with your cost of living so overall i think i certainly would believe it's a good area of the market to be in. Great. Well, that's all we have time for today. Job, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with anyone you think will also find this interesting. If you want to learn more about investment trusts, we have a wealth of information available on our website, which you can find in the show notes. Important information not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved. You may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and the annual reports of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract 
for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for the regulated record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Jana Senderson Investors. Jana Senderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Jana Senderson Investors International Limited. Reg number 3594615. Jana Senderson Investors UK Limited. Reg number 906355. Janice Henderson Fund Management UK Limited, reg number 2678531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited, reg number 260646. Each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate, London. EC2M 3AE and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and Janice Henderson Investors Europe S.A. Reg number B22848 at 2 Rue de Bitborg, L1273 Luxembourg, and regulated by the Commission de Surveillance du Secteur Financier. Janice Henderson. Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janice Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright Janice Henderson Group PLC. Yield, the level of income on a security, typically expressed as a percentage rate. For equities, a common measure is the dividend yield, which divides recent dividend payments for each share by the share price. For a bond, this is calculated as the coupon payment divided by the current bond price. The rating, when the market changes its view of a company sufficiently to make calculation ratios such as P substantially higher or lower, this a re-rating. NAV the total value of a fund's assets less its liabilities. Dividend yield, the dividend yield, expressed as a percentage, is a financial ratio, dividend slash price, that shows how much a company pays out in dividends each year relative to its stock price. Volatility, the rate and extent at which the price of a portfolio, security or index, moves up and down. If the price swings up and down with large movements, it has high volatility. If the price moves more slowly and to a lesser extent, it has lower volatility. Higher volatility means the higher the risk of the investment.